All right. Uh, okay, so any questions about RSA? That's an important one. You can count on you know several homework problems, test questions involving uh, RSA for sure. Okay, next up, uh, Diffie Hellman. Okay, Diffie Hellman, of course, was invented by Williams. Malcolm Williams. Uh, another guy who was working at GCHQ, and in fact, uh, when I was at NSA, he was still working for the government at that time, and I met the guy a couple of times. Um, still doing very interesting work at that time, probably retired by now. Uh, it was reinvented completely independently by uh, Diffie and Hellman at Stanford. I've also met Diffie. Actually, my PhD dissertation work was related to a problem he posed, and he chatted with me about it a couple times. So. Very interesting character. Yeah. Are we allowed to know what GCHQ stands for? Uh, I think it's Government Communication Headquarters. So uh, the British uh, sort of have, the NSA does two <coughs> things, right? The NSA builds cipher systems and they also try to break cipher systems. So it's InfoSec and uh, Information Security and I forget what they call the breaking part. Anyway, <coughs> breaking and breaking, they do both. The British split it in two, so they have one group that constructs ciphers and one group that tries to break ciphers. And GCHQ is the guys, I believe, who built the ciphers. So it makes sense that they would actually be looking at these uh, kinds of problems. Uh, okay, so Nippy Hellman is a key exchange algorithm. Okay, in this class, when we say Dippy Hellman, you should say Dippy Hellman key exchange all together. Okay, let's try. Diffie Hellman key exchange. Okay, good. Uh, it's not for encryption, it's not for decryption, it's not for signing. It's only for establishing a shared symmetric key. And it uses sort of public key kinds of techniques, and that's why we consider it a public key system. Uh, okay, now every public key system has to be based on some hard mathematical problem. For the knapsack, it was the knapsack problem. For RSA, it was what hard problem? Back. Okay, so for Dippy Hellman, it's going to be the so called discrete log problem. What does that mean? Well, okay, it means you're given a G, uh, a number G, a number P, and you're also given G to the K mod P. So you're given three numbers. Okay, one of them you know is G, one of them knows P, one of them is G to some power mod P. And the problem is to figure out what is that exponent there. Now, Forget the mod p for a minute. Suppose p is not there and mod p is not there. I give you g and I give you some number and I say it's g to the k for some k. How do you find k? You take the logarithm base g and you get k. Okay, you can punch that in your calculator. Log base g and you will get k. That's the logarithm problem. That's an easy problem. You punch it in your calculator, you get the number. This is a hard problem. You just throw that mod in there, and as far as anybody knows, it's a very hard problem to solve. Uh, the number P is a prime, and that's public. Okay, we're going to make that public. The number G is also going to be public. G has to have to satisfy this certain property. We call it a generator. It's easy to find such things. Okay, so G and P are public. They're just, they're just given to us. Okay, everybody gets to see those guys. Now here's the way the system works. Alice selects a secret exponent A. Bob selects a secret exponent B. Alice computes g to the a mod p, sends it to Bob. Bob computes g to the b mod p, sends it to Alice. Okay, now what does Alice know? Alice knows g to the b mod p because she got it from Bob, and she knows a. So she can raise that to the a power and get g to the a b mod p. Bob knows g to the a because he got that from Alice. He knows b because he made that up himself. He can compute g to the a, b, mod p. They both now know g to the a, b, mod p. They can use that as a shared symmetric key. Okay. That's the idea. Now why would you want to do this? Why don't you just share a symmetric key? It can be different every time. Well, it can be different. That's good. Okay. It's giving you sort of a random key. That's always good. They don't have to agree on anything. 
Yeah, they don't have to hire John Walker or somebody like that to distribute their keys. They can just use this public system and they can get a, an agreed upon key. Now, if Trudy can't get it, great, we're in business here. Okay. Um, okay, now what does Trudy get to know here? She doesn't know A because Alice, that's secret to Alice. She doesn't know B because that's secret to Bob. What does she know? She knows G, she knows P. Those are public parameters. What else does she get to see? Well, G to the A, because Bob, Alice computed that and sent it to Bob. So Trudy gets, you know, snoop that off the wire. And G to the B mod P. So she gets G to the A, G to the B mod P, and she knows G and she knows P. Can she get G to the A, B mod P? That's what she wants, right? Because that's the key. Well, okay, it's kind of tempting here. She knows G to the A mod B and G to the B mod B. Take the product of those two guys and get, oh, you're so close, G to the A plus B, but not G to the A, B. Okay, so it doesn't quite work. But Trini does get to see this, and she gets to see this. Can she find A from this? Can she find B from this? Yeah, it's easy. It's just that discrete log problem, right? Well, okay, so if the numbers are big enough, she can't do that. It's computationally impossible, it, infeasible to do that, okay? So if, assuming she cannot solve either of these problems, it looks like she's out of luck here, okay? Although she knows a lot, she can't quite get there, <laughs> all right? Okay, so here's the picture. Uh, the public parameters, again, are G and P. Alice chooses her secret exponent A. Bob chooses his secret exponent B. Alice computes G to the A mod P, sends that to Bob. Bob, G to the B mod P, sends it to Alice. What is their secret? What is their shared secret here? G to the A B mod P. They can both compute G to the A B mod P, but Trudy apparently cannot. They can use, then they can use this as their shared symmetric key. Looks good, right? It looks like a free lunch. I thought there was no free lunch in security. Oh. Well, unfortunately, there's a problem here. The problem is this. Suppose Trudy's sitting here in the middle as they're doing this uh, thing. Okay, they say, okay, let's establish a key, and Trudy sneaks into the middle here. Okay, now Alice, just following the protocol here, she sends G to the A mod P. But Trudy intercepts that, and instead of sending G to the A on to Bob, she sends G to the T mod P, right? Because she knows G and P, so she can compute G to T, make up some value of T. And Bob's none the wiser. He thinks that came from Alice. So he completes the protocol here, sending G to the B, and Trudy intercepts that and sends G to the T. Okay, now what does Alice compute? She computes G to the A T. What does Bob compute? He gets G to the B T. What does Trudy compute? Both. Both. She knows both. So Alice, you know, uses this as her key and encrypts the message, sends it. Trudy intercepts it, reads it, changes it, does whatever she wants, encrypts it with this key, sends it to Bob. Bob decrypts, doesn't even know that that happened, sends back, back and forth. Trudy's in the middle. She can read everything that goes back and forth. Okay. This is a problem. <laughs> okay, so we'll see lots of things like this when we get to protocols in a couple chapters, you know, man, you know, sorts of attacks like this. But um, what can we do about this? How can we prevent this attack? There, oh, there you go. Okay, there's actually lots of things we can do to prevent this. It's not so hard. We can take that Diffie Hellman exchange, those values that are being sent back and forth, and we can encrypt those with a symmetric key. Okay, or we can take those values that are going back and forth and we can encrypt them with a public key. Or we can take the values that are going back and we can sign them. Trudy can't do any of those things because she doesn't know the symmetric key you share. She doesn't, <coughs> doesn't know the private keys. We're good here, right? It's no problem. Okay, what is Diffie Hellman for again? Key exchange. Okay, well, if we already have a symmetric key, why are we doing a key exchange? <laughs> okay, if we already have public and private keys, why don't we just encrypt the symmetric key we want and send it back and forth, and nobody can read that. We don't need this fancy dipping helmet thing, okay? Um, so, I always kind of hate to just leave it there at this point, you know, in case Dippy ever sees this video. But, uh, <laughs> because it makes it look like it's really pointless at this particular 
place, but it's not. We'll actually see when we talk about protocols that Diffie Hellman is very useful. It, has its, it certainly has its uses. Um, but for now, we sort of have to just leave it here. The thing to be aware of is there is this man in the middle, okay, so we have to do something to prevent that man in the middle. We have to be aware of that, okay? All right. Okay, so any questions, Diffie Hellman? It's actually very simple, very simple uh, public key system, okay? Uh, okay, now elliptic curve cryptography, uh, we have to skip this section, unfortunately, and I really hate to do that because uh, this is the future of public key cryptography. The U.S. government, I think a year or two ago, came out with a set of guidelines, you know, standards for public key cryptography. All of them were based on elliptic curves. I, I think all of them, or almost all of them, were based on elliptic curves. Now, um, I just want to say a couple words about elliptic curve. We can't, you know, we don't have the time to go into it, but um, elliptic curve cryptography. Elliptic curve cryptography is not a particular type of public key system. It's not like RSA. It's not like Bitcoin. instead what it is is it's another way to do the math that shows up in public key systems. Okay, so there's an elliptic curve version of RSA, there's an elliptic curve version of Diffie-Hellman, and that, one, that one's in the book, it's very, that one's pretty straightforward. So, uh, why would you do that? Why would you do the math a different way? Well, what happens is, when you use elliptic curves, the math is actually slightly more complex, but you can get away with using much smaller numbers. So there's kind of a trade-off there. Smaller numbers, smaller numbers of bits, right? But more complexity. But it turns out it's a win overall. You can make it much more efficient because you use so much smaller numbers. Even though the math is slightly more complex, it's still overall much more efficient. So it's an issue of efficiency with the curve per time. Okay. I have a question about it. 